Welcome to the What If Podcast. My name is Lonsagela Lonzila, and today I'm joined by Dr. Marisa. Dr. Marisa, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Please call me Tendai. Tendai. Sure. Right, so if you don't know who Tendai is, he's an author on all things around citizen engagement, democracy, development, sustainable development. Um, if you want to know more about him, you can go onto his website, which is www.tendaimarisa.org. Did I get it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> you can follow him on Twitter. He's also got a YouTube page. So in case you didn't know who he was, now you know who he is. Today we are talking about local government. My first question is, what interested you in local governance and just governance as a whole? Yeah, I think, and thanks for that. That's a great uh, question. I think if you're going to be a student of political science, a student of power, a student of democracy and development, you have no choice, but you're going to find yourself wading through the murky waters of local government, uh, local governance, local democracy, because like we say, Development itself is a very, has got a local expression. Uh, democracy has got a local expression. Politics is played at a local level. So in a country like Zimbabwe, you have to understand the local governance system that is, a, that is in place and how it plays out. Right. So looking at our local government, how would you describe it? How well are we doing mm. in running or governing our local governments? Yeah, but you, I think... I will not charge to say well or badly, okay. but I think it's a site of contestation. If there's been a site of political contestation, it has been around our local governance system. Uh, since maybe the turn of the century, when we had by then a very young party, the Movement for Democratic Change under Morgan Changirai, when, it, when the first elections under his leadership, they swept all the urban constituencies, all the urban wards, across Blawayo, across Gweru, across almost all the urban cities. And we began to see a system whereby the opposition was running all the urban wards and the ruling party still ran the rural wards. But also it was the beginning of the moment where you may begin to say heightened contestation politically, but also decay in local governance. It became a moment of challenge because there were two tensions. You had a political party that had just come onto the scene with no visible experience in terms of local governance, even, even those who were coming into being councillors, some of them had no record of being uh, elected officials, etc., etc., coming and occupying these positions. But there was also, and it was very visible, that uh, the ruling party at the time, through the use of the Local Government Act or the, uh, the Urban Councils Act, uh, beginning to impose measures or meddling in the affairs of local authorities. So we begin to see a lot of uh, removals of mayors, changing from executive mayor and appointment of commissions, etc. So we always used to say that those are signs of sour grapes on the part of uh, the ruling party because it had lost out on uh, urban constituencies. Because imagine you have the seat of power, but you're not running that seat. You're not running Harare. Somebody else is running it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would like us to just take a couple of steps back. Okay. Let's go back to 1980 and independence and work our way all the way to 2023. Okay. Would you say there are extensive changes in the way local government is run? Okay. Now, I think the local government should be understood. What I described earlier is the visible political expression of local government uh, authorities, rural, uh, rural or urban authorities. In your urban authorities, you're talking of your municipalities, your town boards, etc. while it's in the rural areas or rural district councils. But so what I described earlier is the role of elected officials, the people that we directly elect into office. But those people do not run councils on a day-to-day -day basis. There is a layer, a bureaucracy, that runs that. And usually that bureaucracy is, run, is led by somebody called a town clerk. That is the chief executive officer of the local authority. And in, ma in many instances, those bureaucrats, the experts who run, so you've got a qualified, normally town clerks are either accountants or lawyers or just people with experience in public administration. Then you have your city engineer who tends to be an engineer by profession. You have the town treasurer who tends to be an accountant. Then you have your city health director who tends to be a medical doctor. So you have these experts that actually run. But what you don't have is a corresponding expert uh, or expertise 
in councils. So we have people who are elected on a popular ticket. They do not necessarily have the same way with that in terms of expertise. So the conversations that are happen have always been like that. So you have the popular conversations, then you have the technical conversations. So at times they miss each other in the jargon. So if you're talking about uh, the evolution, you're looking at that sort of what we may call what Max Weber taught us about bureaucracy. You've got this Weberian system, a bureaucracy that is established based on, meri on what you may call a meritocracy. So people who are actually uh, rigorously interviewed for jobs, etc., they secure these jobs based on their professional expertise. So they come and they run a town council, they run a city, etc. But funny enough, they have to report to their bosses who are the elected office holders. Some of these elected office holders come from very common backgrounds. They may have been in the informal sector. They may not have been trained. They may not have even read the Urban Councils Act. They may not even know how councils work, but we elect them nonetheless. So the tension from 1980, I would say, has always been the tension between the experts and the elected officials. But because the, the period you're asking about was mostly, if you like, was mostly a one-party state, 1980 to 2000. So the, the, the tensions we had at that moment did not necessarily have to do with the politics or political belonging, but it had to do with the issues I'm raising about the technical issues, how to, to do things. So for instance, let me give you an example. You find that the experts would say to the office holders, don't worry yourselves about the details of the budget because it's painstaking. We'll do the budget for you. But we, as citizens, we do not confront the office holders. We confront, sorry, the, the people who run the affairs of council on a day to day basis, the experts or the technocrats. But we go to the elected officials who are literally in the same position as us. They are not privy to how actually public funds are managed. So that has always been the challenge. So when you hear commentaries, people challenging to say, oh, mayor so-and-so is working, etc., etc., it's really a fallacy because the mayor does not run the affairs of council. Uh -huh. He's not a day-to-day -day officer of council. Uh -huh. He comes to chair council meetings that are normally usually held once in, a four, in four weeks. And they get a report from the chief executive officer of council, who is the town clerk. So we need to understand that. So that's one trajectory. Then there's another trajectory. So I'm, I'm talking here about the technical aspects of development. But there's also something else if we go into rural areas, where we begin to say that as we begin to see the merging of what used to be district councils and rural councils into the rural district councils, what we began to see as a point of tension in the rural areas was the tension between rural district councils and traditional authority. Yeah? Because traditional authority, the chiefs, the headmen, and the subordinate structures, they saw themselves as having the responsibility, number one, to adjudicate over land conflicts, to allocate land, etc. Well, at least if you look again at the RDC Act, it supposes that they have that responsibility too. So there was always a challenge. So in the rural, district, rural areas, what we saw in the first and the second dec decade was the emergence of, of instance of this tension, but manifesting through informal land sales. So people could go and get land through a tradition called Kuombera, through a chief. But the challenge that RDC had to what? To approve of that transaction. So it was always been, even up to now as we speak, there's that tension because government has not clarified it. Actually, government in 1996, through the Traditional Leaders Act, actually made it worse because they now made it clear that chiefs can allocate land, especially in customary areas. So we have that tension to say, so who is running the councils? Who is responsible for developing the plan in the rural areas? Is it the rural district council or is it the chiefs and the traditional structures? So there's an assumption that they can work together. It's benign on paper, but in real practice it's very difficult. So this, that has been the challenge to say, how do you accommodate what I would call a modern understanding of governance in the rural areas using a Weberian mechanism, which is your bureaucracy, run by the, whoever, the chairperson of the RDC and also the subordinate structures, but also working with traditional leaders. So that has always made uh, local governance in rural areas across Africa, a mess. It's difficult to begin to say, so is there a development plan, etc., etc., who's responsible for roads, etc., etc., so all that. And then combined also 
with what we've begun to see the government doing in terms of elevating the prestige of chiefs, you know, making sure that the chief's house is the one that has got electricity, that the chiefs have got cars, vehicles, etc. So their prestige is high up there. So they actually think they have the wherewithal uh, of even commanding the RDC to say, come and do this in my district, but in the absence of a plan. So the challenge is around the planning framework or the planning methods to say, to what extent can they work together? So I think if there's been a weakness, is the failure to bring those two parties uh, to a place whereby they can actually begin to speak with one voice around planning, etc. Slightly different in the urban areas, but those are the tensions we have had around sort of local governance. Right. So I just want to take you back to an issue that you raised around the tension between a politically elected um, person and the bureaucracies and technocrats that are actually running the business, right, in local government. Um, I heard a saying that, I think the way the person put it is that culture can eat rules for breakfast, mm -hmm. or there's a way that someone put it. So if already in local governments, we have a culture that is built and the system will run whether there's an elected person or not. Yeah. Can we say that then the elected people are pawns? Because what power do they have to adjudicate or like to yeah. run the local You know, culture? that's what we've been trying to explain even in the meetings that we've had. So you're saying actually, yeah, actually it says culture can eat rules, but actually we, in leadership and in strategies, culture can eat strategy for breakfast. breakfast. Yeah. So, and I want to go back to that one because I think, I think there is the popular assumption or the popular understanding of local government. So, for instance, in Mulawa, you guys know of Mayor David Coulter, but you don't know the town clerk. But the Mayor David Coulter cannot commandeer vehicles to go and clean up an area. The town clerk has to do it with the, di with the city engineer or the director of, of health or somebody responsible for refuse, etc., etc. So half the time, for purposes of maybe optics, it looks like, oh, this mayor's busy is doing this, etc., etc. But it has to be in a place whereby there is collaboration, there's a good relationship between the mayor or the elected officials and the bureaucracy. So at times things collapse when there's tension between those. It's the same even with national government. We talk a lot about saying, oh, this minister is not competent, but we forget who is perman permanent secretary and the team working on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, the other person is just a politician. He's going to be given a report to read by his permanent secretary. Same thing with local governance. So the issues now that we have is uh, in the rural areas. So RDCs, those who are in RDCs, have to find a way to deal with this issue you're raising, the culture eating uh, breakfast for strategy, uh, eating strategy for breakfast. So now they have to find a way to say, yes, you may be an expert. Yes, you may have been brought in to rein in to make sure that there's effective budget utilization. But you realize that your job is going to be difficult if you do not collaborate, if you do not find ways of collaborating. And in many instances, we circumvent collaboration by looking at what the chiefs want and we give them. To say, oh, the chief wants a road to his house, so let's just accommodate it in the project. Then we are free to do other things. So it's not really collaboration. It's just throwing uh, little incentives for them to approve of your plans or for them to work with you. So there's always that very difficult tension that they have to navigate. But also remember, there are ward councillors that are elected even in the rural areas. So what we are beginning to see is we are beginning to see that in some rural areas, we're actually seeing uh, official or sort of elected officials from different political parties. So they now have to, unlike decades ago, away to just be one political party. So now there's need for that kind of discussion to happen again amongst ward councillors coming from different political parties. That begins to say, maybe for us as citizens watching from outside, that can usher in a new culture of accountability, that they're just not singing from one, the same uh, hymn book, but maybe we can begin to see some tensions. But in the bigger cities, the opposition dominates. We all know that. And we are having challenges right now, but the effectiveness of local authorities uh, in the urban areas. We have tried a Seville Institute on several rounds to measure or to gauge the popularity of local authorities uh, in terms of service delivery, expectations, etc. And it's always been low. So even now, where we're going, if you're looking at uh, we're in 2024, the next elections are in 2028. But if we look at the national dynamics, the, the tensions around recalls, etc., etc., our focus again has been taken away from doing a proper work on focusing on the delivery and effectiveness of the local councils that we have. So again, they may have a clean sheet because we are not paying adequate attention to whether they are performing or not. So those are the challenges because we have to be checking this thing you're talking about, saying 
is culture dominating or is strategy dominating? If there's strategy, because like right now, the Minister of Local Government has called all local authorities to come up with bankable projects, come up with a strategy for turnaround. So it's something that very few people are talking about because we're interested in these recalls, etc., the fights that are happening within the opposition. But there's something that may look like a game changer or we may actually see the dissolution of certain councils if they do not comply with what the ministry is asking for. So we're actually at crossroads in terms of where we are going with local governance. We could actually find a deepening of a more bureaucratic and effective system, not necessarily democratic, but something that delivers on the basis of bureaucracy and the basis of strategy, uh, better utilization of resources, etc. So that there is a potential of seeing that. I'm not so sure about the democracy project, given the challenges we've seen in the opposition party. Right. I overheard a conversation that you had yesterday with one of our colleagues around the dissemination of power and the dissemination of funds to the local government. One of the things that I think you raised, if I heard you correctly, you are free to interrupt me and tell me, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> but one of the things that you mentioned is local government doesn't necessarily have its own budget. It comes from the provincial government. Is that correct? No, it's the other way around. So what... You, you had the conversation, you're right. My criticism of devolution, devolution is a great policy, by the way. It's just that the government of Zimbabwe has to make it, has to come, in fact, not the government, the people of Zimbabwe have to choose because we have what you call a unitary state, unlike Nigeria, which is a federal state where all states are run by governors. But in our unitary state, over the years, we've congealed around something called governance in the provinces. But these governors really have a budget. So you will not see... Minister Mtulin uh, making a budget to say to Matebele and North, I'm giving so much to Bulao. But what we begin to see is actually when it comes to devolution funds, they are going to specific local authorities. Yeah. So the role of the provincial authorities is not yet clear. Because in other contexts where you have governors and provincial authorities, you actually see them as budget holders. But at the moment, they're not holding any budgets. The, but the layer below them holds a budget. Right. Yeah. And Half the time, some of us who are in the accountability movement were beginning to say, so if you look at two provinces that give us problem, it's Harare Metropolitan and Bulueyo. Because Bulueyo has got two authorities. There's the Bulueyo province, provincial authority. Then there is the Bulueyo local, uh, the city authorities. So we begin to say, so who, who's responsible for what? Mm -hmm. yeah? so, so at the moment, we need that clarification. So the challenge with devolution, and even those who've been talking about it, is that we're focused mostly about what the Minister of Finance does at the central level to the local, the disbursements that are made. But we're not looking at how have they devolved planning autonomy to, local, to provincial first and then local authorities. So I think we need a, a bigger conversation around that. And also devolution makes the assumption that if you're a devolved authority, you have revenue collecting mechanisms beyond just rates. Okay. So there's a big discussion right, right now going on around uh, Zinara. Blue is complaining to say allocations from the National Roads Authority are not enough for us because we've got so many cars, etc., etc., and it's not working well for us. So the devolution uh, process or frame, framework has actually been a top-down process. Uh, it's, a, it's an agenda that has come from national government. Uh, it's not an agenda that has come from the people because I, I'm supposing that it came from the ground. It will be qualitatively better. It will be broader than just talking about allocation of uh, financial resources from the Ministry of Finance. But actually, we we'll begin to talk about what can provinces do and what can local authorities do. So they begin to actually have a better framing of uh, planning autonomy. So let me use an example and then I'm done. So the Provincial Coordinating Committee which is chaired by the governor, normally as the provincial health director, head of intelligence for that pro uh, province, somebody from education and uh, somebody from, say, agriculture, etc., etc. That's the provincial coordinating committee. But if you look at all those people who are in that meeting, they all report to separate ministries. They are all in the province with a mandate to implement the policy or the strategy of the central, the ministry that they report to. So there's really... A provincial strategy. So in the absence of a provincial strategy, can we really talk of devolution? It's a good question. And I think I opened the Pandora's box by asking about that devolution of yeah, power. Yeah. I'll just quickly take us back to the discussion that we had around the tensions between the politicians and the bureaucrats, the rural district council and the traditional leaders. As we reimagine the future, um, 
how can we solve the situation? Is it solvable? It is. You know, it's so interesting. There is a, there's a golden moment in Zimbabwe's history uh, from 1980, 81, 82, 83, thereabouts. There was an attempt to, do a, to introduce a bureaucratic system even in the rural areas. So we had ward councillors, ward development committees, etc., etc. But I think it is around 84, 85 where we begin to see even ZANU-PF itself thinking that they've touched a raw nerve because they've ignored chiefs. Because remember, for many ruling parties, including ZANU-PF and others in the region, chiefs are an important appendage of power. They help to mobilize power. So I think it's actually Edison Zobo who's quoted to say, we are about to abandon our culture. What were we going to accomplish without these people? They're an important part of who we are. So as long as African governments are still trying to create this fusion of power between traditional and modern, we are going to find ourselves in these conundrums where we actually do not move. So now and again, yeah, now and again, you find the president allocating vehicles to chiefs. Then you ask, is that for the chief's benefit or for the chief's area? So we don't know if the car is being given to the chief to use for his personal use or that the, the area that the chief actually heads uh, actually needs the vehicle. Because other commentators will say the chief could have benefited if they had given him an ambulance rather than his car. So I think it comes from, number one, patronage politics, and number two, to us, for us to understand, should we look at the chief in his person or her person, or should we look at the chief and the people that he or she represents? Because if it's about the people they represent, then we need to understand the needs of those people. So it's probably not the chief's car that they need, okay. something else. So I think once, for me, I think the fusion is false. It actually needs to be done away with. We need to modernize our local governance system to say we have one coherent system, regardless of whether we're in the rural areas or the urban areas, we have one system. Traditional authority in a republic does not work. Radical as it may sound, uh, people will tell me about their cultures, Amasigo, but that can be done outside of official parameters of power. Because we are dancing on the same spot because we are refusing to accept. So we keep on saying, oh, we'll do something that is modern, but we'll go to a certain extent. Then we're going to do tradition because we're these people. And that has not taken us anywhere. We are literally dancing on the same spot. I understand. I think it's a very controversial issue. And it makes me think about some of the conversations that people have around, should Africa then come up with its own form of governance and democracy to incorporate these elements that didn't come with colonization, per se? So I think it's a topic for another day. But what you've touched on is very, very interesting. And I think we should have a sequel. I agree. I, 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 I totally agree. But I, just to conclude that the exceptionalism of Africa is very false. Because almost every continent we're looking at, except maybe North America, but every continent that we see people away from that region developing to present day, 21st century, he had to deal with feudal authority, which is what traditional authority is. And they had to find a place of disciplining it. So, for instance, now when you're looking at... Uh, what you celebrate as the monarch in Britain, it's a disciplined feudal authority that is only symbolic. It is, plays no other role except being symbolic. You go to many other countries, you'll find, you'll be surprised they have kings. Belgium is a king. All the other countries, I think Norway has got a king, but they just do not play any meaningful role in the day-to-day -day governance issues of that country. But Africa is struggling just to deal with that. But, and I think it's, it's an opportunistic move because it's servicing political agendas. But is it also that we're searching as a continent, as a people? We are still trying to figure out how does this thing work? Can we find our own way to make it work? Ghana got independence in 1957. It's still dealing with this issue. So I think we're spending so much time. We, we, we're, either we're going to deal with it or we might as well just surrender and say we have no answers to it. Because we are not alone in this. Many African countries are dealing with the subject of saying, where do we place traditional authority? What is its role? Every political party finds itself trying to win them over for, for voting purposes. Right. I think you might have touched a nerve for some people over there. But um, we're just going to conclude that um, we still need a lot of work to be put into these yeah, yeah. structures and Definitely. to make sure that we are moving forward in a very constructive manner. So, Doc, any closing remarks on this issue? No, I'm happy that there is going to be an opportunity for a sequel on this subject. I was always skeptical when we started out because the topic is very broad uh, and also the period that we're looking at from 1980 up to now. 
So what we've just done maybe is to introduce concepts because it's a, it's a twin conversation. You are looking at both the issues to do with development and you're also looking to do with issues to do with democracy itself. How do you promote democracy in a context, in a context of uh, hereditary power? And tensions. And those tensions. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Tindai, thank you so much for indulging us. I think it was a very interesting conversation myself. I learned a lot from this. So please make sure you follow us, you subscribe to the channel. We'll be seeing you hopefully in the sequel <laughs> of this uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Tindai, and goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking time to listen. Please feel free to rate and review us on iTunes. But if you have any comments or questions, please send them to my email, tendai.morisa at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter. My handle is at tmorisa. Thank you again.